Good morning. Here we are back again, and we're, today we're going to take what we learned in the last two sessions, and we're going to do a painting. First of all, as I had said before, you want to moist your colors, agitate your colors. So we'll put a little water there. And I have drawn here just not too detailed. I don't care for detailed drawings because I think it cuts down on creativity. So kind of just a rough sketch is really the way I like to paint. Some people like to make a more detailed drawing, but then I think it's more like coloring in a coloring book, and uh, that's not what you really want to achieve. So this morning, <clears throat> the first thing we want to do is I divided the paper into thirds, just like I said, to create the center of interest. His face, or the head of this rooster, is certainly the center of interest. As you can see here, this is the center of interest, and it's one-third, one-third, one-third. Okay, so now what I want to do is, the first thing I want to do is paint his around his eye. Anything that you're painting that has an eye in it, being an animal, a bird, a person, I always say you need to do the eye first because if the eye isn't correct, you can just take this piece of paper and throw it away. Versus painting the whole thing and then painting the eye and found out, oh Lord, here's a mistake I can't fix, I can't fix. So I'm gonna paint right there where his eye would be. And this is called wet on dry painting. The paper is totally dry. We will do some wet on wet later on as we get into this. So now I've left his eye. We'll come back after this is dry and put the area around it. And of course with a chicken, he always has this little tab that hangs down here that's white. So we'll paint that and we'll paint down to here. I'm using Windsor Red. Windsor Red is a very powerful red, but it's also very transparent. And of course, I like transparent colors. You can see here how bold it is. It's a very bold color, but it's a wonderful color. It was one of the first that Windsor Newton made. Windsor Newton, I use primarily Windsor Newton paints. Windsor Newton started making watercolors around 1840. And interesting enough, I was reading just the other day, they developed the little metal tube that I squeeze paint out of. Like this. They, this happens to be a tube of Windsor Red. They developed this metal tube and the liquid paints in 1845, which when you think about it, that was a long, long time ago, but they were way ahead of themselves. The paper I use, this is Arches, 140 pound cold press. And there again, as I mentioned earlier, Arches has been making watercolor paper since 1492. And it's always easy to remember that because they were started making watercolor paper the year that Columbus discovered America. So the materials I use are certainly nothing new. The only thing new and fresh is water. We do have to start with that. So you can see here how I'm really carefully just painting this end. And I want that to dry now. As I said, we will finish his eye later when that dries. His beak, I'm gonna use uh, the the script liner or the rigger pen, pen uh, brush, whichever you call it. Some call it different things. And I'm gonna take a little or a little yellow and mix right here with just a touch of red to make an orange. And I'll paint his beak in using this rigger brush. It can be used to make fine lines but it can also use to create very detailed paintings like that. Now we're going to get into the body of this rooster. And I want a larger brush. And I'm going to light, slightly wet 
part of his body down through here and follow around to there. Now this is when we're gonna get into some real fun of mixing color on paper. I'm not going to mix up puddles of color over here. However, I'm going to mix on paper and you'll see how this goes. Okay, I'm going to take, I'm gonna start up up by here and I'm gonna come down with this dark color. I want some um, dark blue to come down here. I will mix a little bit of Payne's Gray with it so I can really get it dark. And you can see how that's spreading out. That's just what we want it to do. And we'll bring this down through here. Up here by his head, I'm going to take some brown matter Just touching the edge of that, pull that down. And we wanna get a little bit of yellow in here right now. So we're gonna pull in some yellow, right like this. And you can see how those colors are really blending together. Now down here for his belly or his lower part of him here, we're going to come in. See, I'm just letting the colors touch each other and create their own thing. And that's exactly what you want to do. And I'm introducing some Van Dyke Brown. And then I'm gonna come across here with some, some more dark blue and see that makes a very interesting green and we want this real dark blue to come down here now you want to be careful and leave just a little line right here between one leg and the other one this leg is behind him this leg is the one that is stepping forward so you want to remember those little details. But we're going to bring that down into here. And at this point, I want a little more brownies rust into here. We can bring that right up into there. And if you will notice here, right now is when I want to salt the front of him will create the effect of feathers. And we're gonna sprinkle it right in here. And you'll see later as it dries what it does. And that's just the way we want this to go. Now, we want to create his, all the rest of his feathers. So I'm going to come in here with yellow, bring it all the way down into some of these feathers. There again, I haven't drawn them in, so I can just create these as I go along. You know, it's just a raggly old tail on a rooster. Okay, so that comes in there like that. And we take a little bit of brown matter and we'll And now I'm going to paint his tail. This one feather, the one that's going up here, needs to be a little more detailed and precise than the rest. And you'll see as I come across here,
I do want to right now mix up a little green here. Oh, there, okay. To get this green into his tail. Now, we don't want to be real detailed here. This rooster has got a big old tail. And that's what you want to think about and how, how it goes. And we want to bring it back to here and then stripe it down to We want to make sure we get some darks in there, so we'll pull in some darks in here. At the end of his feathers, I'm going to move, we'll come in here and move in with some um, brown matter, just to add some color. And you can see how these colors are just blending and creating their own thing. Now what we want to do is take a palette knife. There's a number of shapes of palette knives you can use. Uh, let's see. Here's one. You can see this shape, which could use, or this. Doesn't matter, any kind of a palette knife. Now what I'm going to do is right in here, I'm going to scrape in some feathers, and I'm going to scrape in some feathers up here. See, that's just dry enough. What I'm doing is pushing the paint away down to the white of the paper. If it's not dry enough, you'll get a dark color like I did there because what happens is the groove I'm making, the paint is running into the groove. This is just creating a feather, the, the effect of the feathers. So there is our rooster, and you can see that didn't take me more than five minutes to paint. Watercolor, in my opinion, doing it this method, moves very fast. I know sometimes people in my class play with it forever, but the more you play with it and the more you deal with it, the less it's going to look like watercolor and it gets too fine and too detailed. You want this to have the effect of the, when somebody looks at it, they know it's a watercolor. Also, I've learned from many of the classes I've taken, you can never paint the same thing twice. I've had people call me and want me to do that. I can paint something similar to this, but you can never duplicate what I just did here. It's just impossible because of the colors, the amount of water I use, the pigments, etc., etc. So, trying to duplicate something, I would very discourage this, would discourage you from that because it becomes very, very frustrating. <clears throat> what you want is to create a painting so that the viewer begins to imagine and the viewer begins to think out more of the detail. You have just enough detail to make the viewer start imagining and seeing things. That's especially true when you get into a landscape and there's trees involved and there's water involved. The viewer begins to imagining things that's happening there. Secondly, I've been taught that you've, if this was going into an art show or an art exhibit, you want a hundred people to go by and they all see something different. That is a good painting because there again, you're getting the person involved into imagining. And that's what you want. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to work on his legs. These are bright yellow, but I'm not sure I like that right now. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to paint his, his legs and his feet. There again, you can do this. I'm using this as a number four brush that I bought at Hobby Lobby, and it's one of the best I've had. 
I bought a number of brushes at Hobby Lobby and their brand is, um, was a Creative Touch. And they're pretty good, they're, they're very good brushes for the price that you pay for them. I think this brush was only like $6 but I use it a lot. It's got a nice point to it, and it works itself back to a point. That's another thing too. When you're painting like this and you want your brush to get back to a point, just before you pick it up, roll your brush like this. Roll it, and that will bring it right back to a nice point. Now here again, I don't need to paint all of his toes, you know. That's just part of the imagination there. Again, we want somebody to look at this and imagine. Now I can also come in here right now and pick up just a little bit of color if I want. And right in here, I wanna get some yellow. Yellow is not a very good color to work over things. However, sometimes it does because yellow is extremely transparent. Now what I want to do is take this rigger brush, that's dry enough, and I'm gonna take the rigger brush, and I'm gonna, I don't use black. This looks black, but it's Payne's gray. That is as dark as I like to use. So I'm gonna paint the round of his eye very carefully, and that dot in there's his eye. Here I'm going to just put a little edge on his beak and that makes that pop out. And that's what you really want to do. Now, in this area, the colors faded out, so I think we need to bring in some more darks. So I'm going to bring in a few squishes of the effect of feathers again. There again, you can come back and paint over and, and add that, see that? That brought that out. Here you can see what the salt is doing. It's creating the effect of the feathers in his chest here. Right out here on the front of him, and I think this is still wet enough, I can put in some, bring in some lights. There again, there's no whites. So if you want something like that, you have to scrape down to the original paper. Now what I want to do is always a question of what do we do for the background, okay? First of all, I want to paint this area down here and this goes extremely fast. So I don't want to wet that. I want to take this and I want to take this yellow and I'm just going to slightly, lightly touch it. Don't brush it to death. That's what happens too many times is with watercolors, there's a tendency to want to brush too much. Let the water do its thing. Now watch what happens here, see? The water is doing what you can't do, so just leave it alone and let it go, okay? Now, I want to bring in just a little bit of brown matter so it looks, creates the effect of earth. And that's just about what we want there. So now we're back to the detail. What do we, or the background, what do we do for the background? I want to show you what I will use, and this is saran wrap. And interesting enough, the cheapest you can buy is the better. I can get that to come over. If I can find the edge of this, it'll help. Okay, I got it. Here we go. Okay, I'm going to just tear off a piece. Do you think you need okay. to get it close up at all? Pardon? Do you think we need a close up here at all? I don't think so. Okay. I think. Okay. Does this look all right? It's amazing. Does it? Okay. Wow. Now, what I'm going to do is we're going to create a background, and I think what we want to create. For this, we want to create a background of a light green. 
So it looks, we want to create something so it looks like some foliage back there. Green is a very permanent color, so we want to be careful and not get it too dark because once it's on here, it's there. That's it. it you cannot do much more with it. It's a staining color, as is referred to, because it stains the paper and is very difficult to get off. Green is probably the most staining color there is. Now we don't have to be very detailed about his getting around him. We're just gonna get it down to here and over into here. Now what I'm going to do is take a piece of this and I'm gonna lay that down there and I'm gonna push it around with my fingers like this. And you can see it's moving the paint around. It's doing something that you cannot do any other way. But that's just what we want. We want to create an effect back there. And since we have it there and we want that, I want the composition to come this way because he's going this way. So I'm going to come in here and just create a little bit of the same effect just up the side here. And since we're down near the bottom, let's make this just a little bit darker. Now you could create the same type background, not the same type, but you could create a background with this using salt also. Now what I want to do is take some more Saran And there again, the Saran is like Kleenex and paper towel. The cheapest works the best. And most art people, are, most art people are kind of cheap anyway. They try to use everything over and over. So you can see I'm pushing that with my hand and I'm gonna take this little piece here and I'll push this over here. Now we want to let that dry for a few minutes. And while that's drying, I'll explain what happens if we glaze over this. This is too wet, so I can't glaze. I had quite a bit of water there, but that's how the water, you need it wet enough that the salt makes a pattern, and that's just what it did. The question always comes up, when do you use salt? There is no cut and dried rule. The best thing is you don't want it too dry. If it's too dry, it just sits there and does nothing. So you want it to be wet. I don't think it can be over wet. It just depends, you know, when it kind of loses its shine, that is a very good time to sprinkle the water, uh, sprinkle the uh, salt on. So this is where we are at this point. I don't know whether this hasn't dried enough yet up here, so we need to let that dry for a few minutes. Here I made a mark with blue by mistake, and I'll show you, that's a good, good point where I can show you how to lift color out. Because lifting color out sometimes gets just as important as putting color in. Now, what I want to do is when this is dry, and also, there is nothing wrong with using a hair dryer. However, the hair dryer doesn't do too much when you're using it over saran, because the saran is just sealing in the water. But if you have an area like this area of the rooster, that could easily be dried faster using a hair dryer. What you don't want to do is get the hair dryer too close, but a hair dryer from six, eight inches works perfectly. Just turn the hair dryer on low and you'll be all right. So that covers just basically using the ideas 
that I explained in the other part of the film. I do want that to dry, so we're gonna take it just a couple minutes here. And one other thing I didn't mention earlier, I do want to mention, it is always great to have a mat. In fact, one course I took, which was one week every October for three weeks in Wisconsin, almost to Superior, Minnesota, one of the items listed on the supply list was a mat. And she told us what size, knowing what size we were going to paint. Because even during your process, many times you put a mat on it, it completely changes it. Now watch when I put this down on here, okay? It causes you to focus on your painting, not everything else. And I've had classes and I've taught classes where every 45 minutes, every hour, we set our paintings up partially done and put a mat on it. It, get, it creates you to see, it causes you to see totally things differently. So I always encourage having a mat. Uh, as you notice, these paintings that I brought in all have, have been matted. This one, of course, I painted out into the mat and I come back in with some pen and ink, which you can also do and that creates a very interesting painting. Here is a mat that would fit like that, which is smaller. Colored mats are available at uh, Michael's and at Hobby Lobby. Michael's usually has the best variety and they also carry their mat as a little better quality than Hobby Lobby. Pure white mats, of course, work with anything. If you want to get into volume and you want to buy 25 mats or 50 mats, there's a place in California called uh, Golden State Art. Look it up on the internet and their whole business is making mats. Of course, they do it very mechanically with big equipment. They don't cut mats like this. They, they have presses that cut them and they have very reasonable prices. I have bought mats that was 16 by 20, which is what this is to go on this painting. That's a 16 by 20 mat. And I use that quite often in that size because it's a standard mat and it will fit a 16 by 20 frame and a 16 by 20 glass. And you're not getting into custom made mats and custom made frames. But Golden State Art, I have bought mats from them like this, a 16 by 20 that was white on white. And of course I bought them for my class and we divided them all up and paid each other and whatever. But ended up, I think I bought a hundred mats and if you watch the internet, you sometimes get free delivery all the way from California, which I worked that out. And we ended up getting the mats with the backing board and a plastic bag to put them in for about $2.50 a piece, and that is extremely, extremely inexpensive. So I always encourage everybody to have a mat because here is a good example right here. You see this painting? Now watch what happens when I put a mat on it. See what it does? It makes it finished. It also, in this situation, I got blue on blue, this is water, this is a ship, brings out the blue in the sky. Blue on blue works on many, many things, or white on white, of course, or white with a black liner. If you have a white mat and this is a black liner, that can be used on many, many things. Of course, if you're going to paint into the mat, it's obvious you have to have white on white. I've never tried painting on the colored ones, but I, I know it would be a disaster. So you can see what a mat does for that painting. And here's another good example of what mat does for this. And there again, blue and red always go perfectly together. And you can see what happened here. Here is a good example of where I painted this cherry. It probably has three or four coats of paint where I painted over and painted over and painted over and painted over and that's called glazing. The more you glaze, of course, the richer the color and 
you can see here, made the cherry dark, made it dark here. Here it made a highlight. This was created by when it was wet. I took a paper towel and lifted off some paint here. <clears throat> so using uh, glazing can be very effective. Uh, here is an idea that I have used before. And, okay, what do you do for a background? This is apples the botanical name for apples. And I put that in with a stencil, of course, and painted it. And it's interesting how using a floral and putting the botanical name in it, people like that because it's something different. This one is an example of painting a lot of, leaving a lot of whites. In this, I painted around each one of those and left those whites in here. Here is an example where I, this was wet, green, and I touched it with the red from this. Sure, leaves aren't that color, but it makes it interesting. It makes the eye move. You want your eye to keep moving here when you look at this. So the whites here I left, and all of these sections I painted. But that didn't take a long time. I painted this whole thing in less than one hour. So it's not, you know, it's not that difficult, and it's not that. Here is an example of very limited color and pen and ink. It's a very pleasing painting. What I painted from was a couple houses and it didn't have the red flowers. So I thought it needed something to punch out. You need something to grab you. And there I put in just these three bushes. There again, when you're doing things like that, you want to make sure it's in odd numbers. Three, five, okay. Here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven apples. Now that one you don't see much, but that gives you the feel that there's an apple behind there. That's what you can do with composition. On something like this, I, I, I drew just the basic shape here, and then as I'm painting, I added in these other items. But see, it's an odd number. This, the color here has got three main flowers. Here's a partial flower. And here's a bud. So we have five. One, two, three, four, five. Here, I've got three, four, and three. So I've got seven cherries down here. And it's interesting, after painting all these years, I don't even think about it. I just automatically do it. But it's something you can think about and keep that in mind because it certainly helps you create an, an interesting composition. Okay, here. When you look at this, it's got one, two, three, four, five trees. I didn't think that way, but that's the way it is. After painting all these years, that's just the way you automatically think. But see, it's got one, two, three, four, five. And one. You can only need one train. This one is just one, the horse. Here again, his eye was the first thing I painted right there and his eyebrow. Because if that isn't correct, the rest of it, you can just pitch it, throw it away. Okay. This one, I don't know how many rocks this has got. I didn't count it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. But I didn't think of that. It just happened that way on this one. Sometimes I do think them out. I just don't. Okay. This one. Here, you notice I've got three and two. Five. Odd numbers. So keep that in mind when you're painting. That helps you with composition. If you follow that pattern, it's very hard to go wrong. Okay. Now that this is you can see, I hope you can see, see the pattern that that left? And what it was is where it moved the paint around so it pushed the paint into the grooves of this saran wrap. And that makes a very interesting color. Another thing you can do is, this to me is still a little bit on the boring side. So what I'm going to do is come in here with some blue 
Now I don't want it too dark. Okay. Now see what that did? Just splattering. And that's one of the techniques that totally indicates immediately that this is a watercolor. Nothing else splatters like that and works like that. So, right now, I think our painting is basically done. I don't know what I would do with it. It's, many, it's also helpful many times when you think your painting is finished, and I've had instructors tell me this, especially if it's a, a complicated painting and a landscape and ships and all kinds of things in it. Put your paint, when you think it's done, stop before you overdo it. I can tell you when a painting is easily overdone faster than when I can tell you it's not done. But what you wanna do is take your painting when you think it is finished, put it away and don't look at it for a few days. Get it back out and look at it because two or three days, four days from now, you will see it differently. And sitting here working on it, so close to it, you will see indifferently if you set it up eight feet from you. I know the subject come up, what about lighting when you're painting and all of that and where's the window and et cetera, et cetera. The instructor said, remember the person who's going to buy this and hang it up is probably gonna put it in their family room where they have a lamp with a 40 watt light bulb. And I thought that really summed it up when it comes to light. So look at it under natural light away from intense light or windows because so that's where it's normally going to be seen. So we're about to conclude and I just, really this needs to dry further, but you can see how the colors went together. It's the only way you can do it is with watercolors, acrylics and oils, you cannot get this feeling. And I always want a watercolor painting to look like a watercolor painting. You don't want it to look like an oil painting. Oil paintings are made to be very precise. And this isn't, you want this looseness to it. This concludes the three sessions that I have prepared here for film.